Tale of Magic, Chapter 3, Justices Only. We're still read more books in just two weeks of playing in the library than she had in her entire life. By the end of her first month, she had devoured every title on the ground floor and was working her way through the second level. Her quick consumption rate was thanks to an efficient schedule she developed early on. Each evening, Bristol dusted the shelves, mopped the floors, polished the silver globe, and wiped the surfaces as fast as the possibility could. When the cleaning was finished, Bristol selected a book or a few books if it, if it was the weekend and snuck them back to her house. Once she finished washing the dishes from her family's dinner, Bristol would lock herself in her bedroom and spend the rest of the night reading. The following evening, Bristol would return what she had borrowed and her secret routine would start all over again. Bristol couldn't believe how quickly her life had changed. In just one month, she went from having an emotional breakdown in public to the most exciting and stimulating time she had ever experienced. Working at the library gave her access to biographies in, in psychology ideas, dictionaries, anthology, <laughs> anthologies, and textbooks that expanded her grasp of reality. And it introduced her works of fiction, poetry, and prose that expanded her imagination beyond her wildest dreams. But perhaps most gratifying of all, Bristol found the library's copy of the Tales of Tidbit Twitch and finally learned how the story ended. Tidbit reached in all directions as he fell off the side of the cliff, but there was nothing to grab hold of. He feared his, his fall would come to a brutal end against the rocky earth, but by some miracle, the mouse plunged into a rushing river instead. The dragon swooped down the cliff and flew over Tidbit as he floated in the river. The monster tried to swipe the mouse from the powerful stream, but the wa water was moving too fast for the dragon to get a steady grip. Tidbit, Tidbit thrashed around the river as it swept him toward a, a, a towering waterfall. As he rolled over the edge, the dragon dived after him with wide open jaws. The mouse was convinced these were his last moments alive. He would either be consumed by the monster above him or collide with the boulders at the base of the waterfall. He, as he fell farther and farther, the dragon dived closer and closer, and soon the creature's sharp teeth in, encompassed him in mid-air. Just before the monster sank his teeth into the falling mouse, Tidbit fell through a small crack between the boulders at the bottom of the waterfall, and he safely dropped into the lake at the, at the river's end. When Tidbit surf, surfaced the water, he saw the dragon was spread out across the rocks behind him, lying lifeless with a broken neck. Tidbit washed ashore and took his first deep breath in years. With the dragon finally defeated, the kingdom of mice was free from the reign of terror at last. The world welcomed a new era of much needed peace, and it was all thanks to a tiny mouse who braved a big monster. Naturally, Bristol's new routine was exhausting. She only managed to sleep for an hour or two each night. The excitement of getting to read more the next day in energized her like a drug. However, Bristol found clever ways of resting so she wasn't entirely sleep de deprived. During Mrs. Plume's lessons at school, Bristol tied a quill to her fingers and lowered her gaze so she appeared to be taking notes, but was actually taking a much needed nap instead. On one occasion, while her classmates learned how to apply makeup, Bristol used the supplies to draw pupils on her eyelids so no one noticed she was sleeping through the demonstrations. At lunch, while the other girls went to the bakery in the town square, Bristol visited the furniture store and tested the products until the owners caught on. 
On the weekends, Bristol snoozed in between her chores at the e Evergreen House. At church, she spent the majority of the service with her eyes closed, pretending to pray. Luckily, her brothers did the same thing, so her parents never noticed. Aside from the fatigue, Bristol thought her s scheme was going very smoothly, and she didn't face anywhere near as much suspicion as she had feared. She only saw her family for a few minutes each morning, so there wasn't much time for them to question her about her daily activities. Everyone was so focused on Barry's inaugural weeks as a deputy justice that they had never asked about her vo volunteering for the home of the hopeless. Still, Bristol had developed stories about feeling, fe feeding the hungry and bathing the sick in case she needed them. The only hitch happened at the beginning of her second month of employment. One evening, Bristol entered the library to find Mr. Woolsor on his hands and knees searching under his furniture. Mr. Woolsor, can I help you with something? She asked. I'm looking for Champions of the Champions, Volume 3, Mr. Woolsor explained. A student requested it this afternoon and it's vanished from the gels. On Beckenos, on Beck, on Beck, to the librarian, Bristol had borrowed the Champions of the Champions, Volume Three, the night before. She pulled her coat a little tighter around her shoulders so the librarian wouldn't see that the book was tucked under her arm. I'm sure it's here somewhere, she said. Would you like me to help you look? No, 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 he grumped and got to his feet. The assistant librarian probably filled it, filled, filed it incorrectly. Idiot man! Just leave it on the counter if it shows up while you're cleaning. Once Mr. Woolsor was gone, Bristol left Champions of the Champions, Volume 3, on the counter. It was a simple remedy to a simple situation, but Bristol didn't want to experience a closer call to getting caught. To avoid any future risk, Bristol decided it would be wise if she stopped sneaking books home all the altogether. From then on, after she finished cleaning, Bristol stayed at the library to read. Sometimes she didn't return home until the early hours of the morning and had to sneak back into the house through a window. At first, Bristol welcomed the change to her schedule. The empty library was very peaceful at night and the perfect place to get lost in a good book. Sometimes the moon shone so brightly through the glass ceiling, she didn't even need a lantern to see the pages. Unfortunately, it wasn't long and before Bristol became too comfortable with the new setup. One morning, Bristol was awoken by the cathedral bells, but they were different this morning. Instead of the instant ringing that gradually stirred her awake, a thunderous changing caught, a thunderous changing caused her to jump to her feet. The noise was so sudden and alarming, it was discombobulating. When she finally gained consciousness of her whereabouts, Bristol received the second shock of the morning. She wasn't standing in her bedroom. She was still at the library. Oh no, she gasped. I fell asleep reading. Father will be furious if he realizes I've been gone all night. I've got to get home before Mother notices. My bed is empty. Bristol tucked her reading glasses into the top of her dress, stashed the book she had been reading on the nearest shelf, and ran out of the library as fast as she could. Outside, the cathedral bells were causing a hurricane of noise in the town square. Bristol covered her ears and had trouble staying upright as she was hit by, by wave after wave of sound. She dashed down the path toward the east, eastern countryside and reached the Evergreen home just as the final bell tolled. When she arrived, Mrs. E Evergreen was standing on the front porch, frantically looking in every direction for her daughter. Her shoulders sank almost an entire foot when she saw Bristol approaching. Where on God's green earth have you been? She yelled. You had me worried half to death. I almost sent the king's royal guard. I'm so sorry, Mother, Bristol panted. I, I, I can't explain. There better be a good reason why you weren't in your bed this morning. It, it, 
It, it was an accident, Bristol said, and quickly fabricated an excuse. I was up late making beds for the home of the hopeless. The beds look so home comfortable. I couldn't resist lying down. The next thing I heard were the bells th this morning. Oh, please forgive me. I'll go inside and do the dishes from dinner right away. Bristol tried to go inside the house, but Mrs. Evergreen blocked the front door. This isn't about the dishes, her mother said. You can't imagine the fright you gave me. I convinced myself you were lying dead in an alley somewhere. Don't ever do that to me again, ever. I won't, I promise, Bristol said. Honestly, it was just a silly accident. I didn't mean to worry you. Please don't tell father about this. If he finds out I was gone all night, he'll never let me volunteer at the home of the hopeless again. Bristol was in such a panic. She couldn't tell if her performance was convincing or not. She looked behind her mother's eyes. It was difficult to disappear to. Mrs. Evergreen seemed convinced and unconvinced at the same time. Like she knew her daughter wasn't telling the truth, but choosing to believe her lies. This volunteering, Mrs. Evergreen said, whatever in it entails, you must be more careful if you don't want to lose it. Your father will have no problem taking it away from you if he thinks it's making you irresponsible. I know, Bristol said, and it'll never happen again, I swear. Mrs. Evergreen nodded and so softened her stern glare. Good. I may only see you for a, mere, a few minutes each morning, but I can tell volunteering is making you happy, she said. You've been di a different person since you started. It's nice to see you so content. I would hate for anything to change that. It makes me very happy, Mother, Bristol said. Actually, I didn't realize I could be so happy. Despite her daughter's excitement, something about Bristol's enthusiasm made Mrs. Evergreen noticeably sad. Well, oh, that's wonderful, dear, she said with an unconvincing smile. I'm pleased to hear it. You don't seem very pleased, Bristol said. What's the matter, Mother? Am I not supposed to be happy? What? No, of course not. Everyone deserves a little happiness now and then. Everyone. And nothing makes me happier than knowing you're happy. It's just... It's just... What? Mrs. Evergreen smiled at her daughter again. But this time, Bristol knew it was genuine. I just miss having you around, that's all, she admitted. Now get upstairs before your father or brother sees you. I'll do the dishes while you wash up. Then you're finished. Then you're fin you're finished. You can help me in the kitchen. Happiness or no happiness, breakfast doesn't cook itself. The following week, Crystal took her mother's advice to heart. To, to prevent herself from falling asleep in the library again, Crystal limited her nightly reading to just one hour. After she finished her evening duties, two hours at the most, if she found something really good, before packing up and heading home. She didn't get ready nearly as much as she wanted. She didn't get to read nearly as much as she wanted, but any time at the library was better than none. Late one night, while searching for something to read, Bristol strolled down a long, winding hall on the second floor. Of all the sections in the library, she figured this was the least popular because it always needed the most dusting. The shelves were filled with collections of old public records and outdated ordinances. So it was so mysterious why the hall was virtually forgotten. As Bristol browsed the shelves at the end of the hall, a book on the very top shelf caught her attention. Unlike the the leather-bound re records surrounding it, this book had a wooden cover and practically blended into the wooden shelf. Bristol had never noticed the strange book before, and as she marveled at its pecu peculiar camouflage, she began wondering if anyone had ever noticed it. Could there be books in this library that have never been read before, she wondered aloud? What if I'm the first person to read something? 
The notion was very exciting. Bristol rolled a ladder to the end of the hall and climbed to the top shelf. She tried to retrieve the wooden book, but it didn't budge. It's probably been sitting here for centuries, she speculated. Bristol pulled on the book again with all her strength, but it didn't move. Her feet rose off the ladder as she used all her weight to try to pry it loose. But even that didn't help. No matter how hard she tried, the wooden book wouldn't pull it from the shelf. It must be nailed down. What kind of sick person would nail a book to a... Ah! Without warning, Bristol and the ladder were knocked to the floor by something large and heavy. When she looked up, Bristol discovered that the entire bookcase had swung away from the wall to reveal a long and dark hallway hidden behind it. She quickly realized the wooden book wasn't a book at all. It was a lever to a secret door. Hello? Bristol nervously called into the hallway. Is someone there? The only thing she heard was her own voice echoing back to her. If anyone can hear me, I'm sorry about this, she said. I was just cleaning the shelf when it opened. I wasn't expecting to find a door to whatever this creepy hall ends. Once again, there was no reply. Bristol assumed the hidden corridor was just as empty as the rest of the library and didn't see any harm in, in expecting it. She retrieved a lantern and slowly walked down the hall to see where it led. At the end of the hallway, Bristol found a wide metal door with a plaque bolted on it. Justices only. Justices only, Bristol read aloud. That's strange. Why would the justices need a secret room in the library? She reached for the doorknob and her heart fluttered when she felt it was unlocked. The metal door creaked open and the sound echoed into the empty library behind her. Curiosity overpowered her judgment, and before Bristol could stop herself, she disregarded the sign and stepped through the door. Hello, is anyone in there? She asked. Innocent maid coming through. Bristol found a small room with a low ceiling on the other side of the door. Luckily, it was just as vacant as she had predicted. The walls had no windows or artwork, but were lined with black bookcases. The only furniture were lined with, the only furniture was a small table and a single chair in the center of the room. An empty candlestick ador ador adorned the table and a coat rack stood beside it with only two hooks for one, for one hat and one coat. Based on the minimal furnishings, we're still figured the room was meant for only one justice at a time. She put on her reading glasses and raised her lantern toward a bookcase to see what kind of books were kept in the secret library. To her surprise, the justice's collection was, was sparse. Each shelf contained less than a dozen titles, and every book was next to a file of paperwork. Bristol selected the thickest book from the nearest shelf and read the cover, History and Other Lies by Robert Flagworth. The title was difficult to read because the book was coated in ash. Bristol moved her lantern closer and saw that the front cover had been branded with a word in large lettering, banned. Banned, Bristol read aloud. Well, that seems silly. Why would anyone need to ban a book? She flipped the book open and read the first page. It turned to. After skimming a few paragraphs, Bristol had an answer. One of the greatest deceptions in recorded history was the reasoning of the Declawing Act of 339. For hundreds of years, the people of, southern, of the Southern Kingdom had been told that King Champion VI banished the trolls for acts of, of vulgarity. But this was nothing but propaganda to disguise a, ma a macabre plot against an innocent species. Prior to the Declawing Act of 339, the trolls were respected participants in the Southern Kingdom's society. 
they were gifted craftsmen and built many of the structures that still stand in the Chariot Hills Town Square today. They lived quietly in the caves of the su southwest region and were regarded as a peaceful and private minority. In 336, while expanding their caves in the southwest, the trolls uncovered a large amount of gold. At the time, the southern kingdom was still crippled with debt from the Four Corn Corners World War. Upon learning of the trolls' newfound wealth, Champion VI exclaimed, the gold was government property and ordered the trolls to turn it over at once. Legally, the trolls had every right to keep their discovery, and they refused the king's demands. In retaliation, King Champion VI and his high justices orchestrated a sinister ploy to tarnish the trolls' reputation. They spread nasty falsehoods about the trolls' lifestyle and behavior. And after time, the residents of the southern kingdom started believing the rumors. The king banished the trolls to the in-between, seized their gold, and successfully brought the southern kingdom out of debt. Sadly, the leaders of neighboring kingdoms were inspired by the Chakalong Act of 339 and used the same method to erase their own debts. Soon the trolls were unjustly ransacked and, ex and exiled from all four kingdoms. Other intelligent species came to the trolls' defense, but their efforts only caused them to suffer a similar fate. Together, the world leaders in instituted the Great Clean Clean Cleansing Act of 345, which expelled all talking creatures other than humans from their kingdoms. The troll, elf, ogre, and goblin populations lost their homes and their possessions and were forced into the harsh environments of the in-between. With limited resources, the species had no choice but to resort to, bar to the barbaric and primitive survival measures they're resented and feared for, to, for today. The so-called monsters of the in-between are not humankind's enemy, but humankind's creation. Bristol had to read the excerpt twice before she fully understood what it was saying. Was Robert Flagworth exaggerating, or was the decline act of 339 so d dishonest as he implied? And judging by the size of his book, it, if the author was correct, then the Southern Kingdom's history was jam-packed with other fab fabrications. At first, the idea of history being dishonest was difficult for Bristol to comprehend. She didn't want to believe a topic she knew so much about was filled with lies. But the more she thought it over, the more plausible it seemed. After all, the Southern Kingdom was a, a blank latently flawed and oppressive country. Why should she believe it was an honest place? Bristol continued looking through the bookcases and selected another title that caught her eye. The War on Women by Daisy Pe Peppernickel. Just like the previous book, The War of Women was covered in ash and branded with the word banned. With one quick quick glance at the pages inside, Russell was instantly ca captivated by the subject manner. The female mind is not the fragile flower pot we're made to believe. According to many studies on human anatomy, there is no evidence to suggest a woman's brain is any weaker, slower, or less capable than a man's. So the question remains, why are we kept from education and positions of power? Because the justices use the oppression of women as an instrument to maintain their grip on the southern kingdom. By nature, women are more ma maternal than men. If we ruled the southern kingdom, we would govern on principles of enlightenment, empathy, and nourishment, but the justices and the current court system can only function in a society operated by fear, scrutiny, and punishment. If the country began valuing compassion over control, the justices and their govern governing techniques would be rendered absolute.
That is why they take every step necessary to prevent women from rising above them. From the moment we are born, women are brainwashed to prioritize motherhood and marriage over intellect and personal fulfillment. We're handed baby dolls and aprons and told our greatest contributions are accomplished in the nursery and the kitchen. But that lie is a is as damaging as it as as it, as it is degrading because a kingdom is only as strong as its weakest citizen and a society with unjust limitations is less likely to prevail than a country of equal opportunity when a nation segregates any per percentage of its population it only segregates a percent of its potential so, for the sake of the kingdom, it is time for a woman to stand together and demand a new government that values every citizen's thoughts, ideas, and morals. Then, and only then, will a country journey into realms of prosperity it has never seen before. Bristol's mouth dropped open. It was like she was reading the book of her own thoughts. She had never heard anyone else speak about the things she believed, let alone seeing, the print, seeing them printed in a book. She stacked the war on women and history and other lies on the table, eager to f finish them later. But first, she wanted to see what other books were in the secret library. Another enticing title she found was called Losing Faith in Faith by Quint Cuppenmull. Like the previous books, it too had banned branded onto its cover. Bristol opened the book to a random page to get a sense of what it was about. If the Book of Faith was as pure as the monks claim it is, there would be no need to amend it or publish versions over time. However, if you compared a current book of faith to one from a hundred years ago, you would discover vast differences between the religion of today and the rel religion of yesterday. So what does this mean? Has the Lord simply changed his mind over the years? Has the great Almighty corrected his mistakes after being convinced he was wrong? But wouldn't the, uh, the very notion of being wrong Contrad contradict the all-knowing qualities of the Lord is supposed to possess? The truth is, what, starting as a joy what started as a joyful and loving faith is now a politically motivated ruse to control. The people of the Southern Kingdom, whenever the fear of incarnation is not enough to make people obey the law. The justices alter the principles of religion and use the fear of eternal damnation to enforce their agenda. The law and the Lord should be separated, should be separate en entities. But the Southern Kingdom has strat strategically made them the same. Therefore, any activity or opinion that questions the government is considered a sin, and every lifestyle or preference that doesn't ex help expand the population is considered demonic. The Book of Faith no longer reflects the Lord's will, but the will of men who use the Lord as a tool to manipulate their people. Bristol was absolutely fascinated by Quint Kapumul's writing. In all her years attending church, she had never questioned the monks' sermons denouncing murder and theft, but she had always wondered why the monks preached just as passionately about the importance of paying taxes. Now it appeared Bristol had her answer. She put losing faith in faith in her stack and continued searching through the bookcases. The next band title that gained her interest was called The Injustice of the Justices. 
how the king is only a pawn to a monarchy in disguise by Sherful Hinderback. As she moved the book off the shelf, Bristol accidentally knocked over the file of paperwork placed next to it. The document spilled onto the floor and Bristol knelt as she picked up the mess. Until this moment, Bristol ha hadn't had much interest in the files throughout the bookcases, but now she couldn't help reading the papers as she re restashed them. Among the paperwork was a detailed profile of the author Shrivel Hinderback. It was followed by a long Hinderback's whereabouts of, over a period of years. The addresses became more and more obscure with time. What started as houses and inns became bridges and caverns. The dates of the entrance entries also became closer and closer together as if Hinderback had changed his location more and more frequently. The log ended with a warrant for the author's arrest and finally the paperwork included with his death certificate the cause of death was executed for conspiracy against the kingdom. Bristol got to her feet and, and inspected the files beside the books of Robert Flagworth. Daisy, Peppernickel, and Quint Cup a mule. Similar to the documents in the previous file, she found profiles of the uh, author's records of their residences, warrants for their arrests, and eventually their death certificates. And just like Sherville Hinderback, each author author's cause of death was executed for conspiracy against the, king, the kingdom. As if struck by a cold breeze, Bristol had chill, chills, and her body went tense. She felt sick to her stomach as she looked around and recognized the small room for what it truly was. This wasn't a private library. It was a graveyard for truth, an ar archive of people the justices had silenced. They killed them, Bristol said in shock. They killed them all. In time, the books throughout the secret room would introduce Bristol to an assortment of troubling ideas. Her perspective of the world would change forever, but most troubling of all, one of these books was going to change Bristol's view of herself, and once she read it, she'd never look into a mirror the same way again.